7.32 p.m. on Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. Uh, good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Blaine Hoffman. Here. And Ben Kett Holly. Here. Okay. Thank you all. Um, on behalf of the town, uh, Rick Ballarelli, our board administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. And uh, Vincent Lee is our assisting staff this evening. Here. Good to have you with us, Ben. And then appearing on behalf of 24 Grandview Road, uh, Ryan and Devin Thomas. Here. Thank you. Uh, appearing for 1315 Adams Street, um, Ann and Jeremy Wilmer. Here. Perfect, thank you. And appearing for 12 Prospect Avenue, uh, John and Althea Yakimides. Uh, here. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may re meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. In this chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts discusses arbitrates and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands, the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. We're beginning this uh, meeting with our agenda. Uh, item number two on our agenda is the approval of the of decisions. So these items relate to the operation of the board and as such will be conducted um, without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. After introducing each item, I will invite members of the board to provide any comments, questions, or motions they may have members wish to engage in discussion with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself for the record. So first is the approval of the written decision for 3840 Newport Street. Uh, this was the case that uh, had hearing dates in June and July. Um, I wrote up the decision, reported that to the board last week for reviewing comments. Uh, comments have been incorporated and a final draft was issued this afternoon. Are there any further uh, comments in regards to the written decision for 3840 Newport Street. Being none, um, I move to accept the, to approve the written decision for 3840 Newport Street. Uh, may I have a second? Second. Uh, 
vote of the members of the board who are present uh, and voting on that hearing. Um, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Thank you. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. That brings us to item three on the agenda, the approval of the written decision for 79 Ronald Road. This is a case that was heard um, in July of this year. Uh, it was voted on favorably by the board. The decision was written by uh, Mr. Hanlon, distributed for comment, and a revised final copy was issued uh, to the members of the board this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written decision for 79 Ronald Road? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I inadvertently, when I distributed the decision earlier on, forgot to take the draft watermark off and change the uh, and change it from sort of opinion the gray to opinion the white. Uh, and so, when I move, I will suggest those two changes be made. Perfect. Are there any further changes being proposed? Seeing none, I'll turn to Mr. Hanlon for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the uh, proposed written decision in 79 Ronald Road uh, be approved. Thank you very much. As amended by your prior As amended by my prior thing, that is getting the color white and getting the uh, draft mark off. Perfect. Thank you. May um, you have a second? Second. Mrs. Mills. And a roll call vote of the members who are present voting on that decision. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Hanlon. Aye. Mills? Aye. Riccardelli? Aye. Chair votes aye. That decision is approved. That brings us to um, three sets of meeting minutes for approval. The first is the meeting minutes from June 15, 2021. These were distributed to the board um, <clears throat> and comments and, uh, were received back uh, by Mr. Ballarelli. Uh, are there any further questions or comments in regards to those minutes from June 15th, 2021. Seeing none, um, I have a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And, uh, second, Mr. Mills. Aye. Thank you. Second. Uh, and then a vote of the members uh, who were present at that hearing, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Hanlon? Aye. Bill? Bill? Aye. Perfect. Thank you. And the chair votes aye. Uh, those minutes are approved. That brings us to item number five on our agenda, approval of minutes from March 22nd, 2022. Um, again, these were minutes that were distributed by Mr. Valorelli to the members of the board for their review. Um, everyone has had an opportunity to provide comments back to Mr. Valorelli. Are there any further comments or questions in regards to those minutes at this time? Being none, may I have a motion for to approve the minutes from March 22nd, 2022? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Mr. DuPont, a vote of those members present at that meeting. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item number six on the agenda, the approval of the meeting minutes from the April 26, 2022 meeting. Um, the minutes were distributed by Mr. Valorelli to members of the board for their review and comment. Um, everyone has had an opportunity to return comments. Are there any further comments on the minutes from April 26th? Nope. Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, and a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. And a vote of those members present for that meeting, uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. Thank you all very much. That brings us to item number seven, which is the first of our hearings this evening. Uh, turning to public hearings on tonight's agenda, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentations to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on their proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I'll open the meeting for public comment and at the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. 
check there's no one waiting in the waiting room. There's not. So with that, I will turn to the first um, of our three hearings for this evening, uh, which is uh, 24 Grandview Road. That I would ask the applicant to introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Hi, this is Ryan Thomas of 24 Grandview. Uh, my request for this uh, appeal is to install a carport in a currently pavered area off of the driveway, off of uh, Spring Avenue, the kind of alley road that runs next to the house. Uh, currently, because it's a non-conforming lot, it's a 15 foot request because it's a corner lot, so two sides would be 15 feet. Uh, due to a rock wall and hill and uneven terrain and a bunch of mature trees, we're looking to have the carport six feet off of uh, Spring Avenue behind the current privacy fence and over the pavered area, as opposed to the 15 foot setback. I believe all, all images and documentation were submitted. I don't have a copy to share on my uh, computer at this time, though. Go ahead and share that right now. So this is the packet. So this is a request for, a, it's written originally as a request for special permit. I'll pull up a separate uh, page because it is actually a request for a variance. Yeah, um, that was corrected by uh, Rick. So I believe this is the existing area, um, including a trailer that's stored on site. Yep, that's the camper. <coughs> this is an image of the alley or uh, Spring Avenue with the current privacy fence. Just a sense of spring trailer. And this is looking down spring, I believe, that, and the, your property is on the left-hand side? Yes, that's correct. Rotate that. So the uh, Grandview Road is the main street. Spring Avenue is the side street. Um, and this is the proposed location. That's correct. You'll see it's just off the driveway right there. The uh, currently pavered area has a six foot setback from the property line, uh, almost exactly. So I'm guessing he, uh, the previous owner, had had to install it to that specification. Okay. And um, the plan doesn't include uh, the location of any trees and doesn't include any uh, topography. Um, do you sort of explain? Explain a little bit about what the, the nature of the site is. Yes, sure. The uh, if you look, the majority of the property has about a probably a fifteen foot elevation differences across. It is uh, at the start of the slope. It's unable to be accessed by anywhere but the uh, the existing carport area and driveway. The <laughs> uh, quite irregular in the area, but if you look just to the right, the right boundary of the proposed area. There is a row of mature trees, uh, oak trees that are in the area, as well as about a five foot elevation change where the ledge is outcropping. And there's a rock wall built up on top of that and a little below uh, with some landscaping on it. But the ledge is just to the right there, uh, impeding any ability to move it further to the right. And then the rest of the property is elevated from the surrounding street, so there is no other access to the property except for through that area. Thank you. Uh, there's mature trees across the rest of the property as well, but in the area in, in question, uh, there is a mature tree at the corner of the driveway in the uh, whatever the upper left corner would be there. And then there is a nice grassy median, which will remain between the driveway and the uh, proposed area. And then there's probably about 16 feet available width uh, for the proposed 
carport, so I don't have the ability to move it further over to, to be 15 feet off of Spring Avenue, uh, hence only six feet available and with the privacy fence remaining between Spring Avenue and the proposed carport. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, you had shared some images of what the carport might look like. Correct. It is a steel structure with a dark gray uh, metal roof uh, built to the required specifications. Um, and I believe, A, this is not your house. Um, this is more of a generic image, is that correct? That's correct. These were images provided by the, the carport company. Okay. And then I believe um, that the request is, is for simply for the roof and the open sides. Um, I know you have provided some other images with a partial side or with full sides. And I just wanted to confirm that the request West was was simply for the the open sided structure. Yeah, that's correct. That's what I prefer. I just provided the alternatives in case there was a requirement for any type of uh, siding. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought I had an application with a variance to write on hand. Go ahead and share. This is the report memorandum from the planning department in regards to this application. Um, so they note that the applicants are requesting a variance for a reduction of the front yard setback for an accessory structure in the R1 zoning district from 25 feet to 6 feet. Carport will be located to the right of the existing driveway access from Spring Avenue, comply with the rear and side yard setback requirements of six feet, and lot coverage would increase from 17% to 20% of the proposal. That's I, I do have one correction. It is a non conforming property, so it was a 15 foot requirement for the setback. For the front yard setback? That's correct. So I believe the rear yard setback varies by the depth of the lot, but I'm pretty sure in the R1 zoning district, the front yard setback remains 25 feet. Okay. I, I was just told when in my initial call, uh, just because it was a non-conforming property, if I could make it 15 feet, that would work. Oh, I uh, Yeah. Um, so the, and then, so variances, there are four criteria and the criteria are set under state law. Um, so the first of the, and the board has to find all four criteria. Uh, so the first, I'm just gonna quickly read through the criteria and then um, I'll open this to the board for questions. Uh, so the first criteria is to describe the circumstances related to the soil conditions, shape, or, or topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. The second is describe how a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaws, specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above, would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant. Three is to describe how desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good, and then describe how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. So the, there were comments here added by the, the planning department. Um, they know that the topography and the existing vegetation of the site significantly limit vehicular access except from Spring Ave. The property slopes towards the north and east. 
additionally mature trees are located within the front yard along Grand View. Um, this review does not specifically discuss other properties within the zoning district, so that's something the board will have to consider. Uh, okay. Criteria two um, addresses the hardship question. Um, if the applicant were to follow a literal interpretation of zoning by a law, financial environmental costs to create a flat area for the carport on the slope side of the lot would be significant. Uh, criteria three, uh, substantial detriment to the public good proposed area for the carport is already developed with a stone patio and no further increase in the impervious area is needed. And criteria four, without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent of the zoning bylaw, the proposal is consistent. Um, with the general intent of the R1 zoning district. This is a request for an accessory structure. It is not related to the primary structure. <laughs> Additionally, there's a, an image, uh, Google image of the house. Um, you can see it's tightly surrounded by trees. Mm -hmm. Give you a feel for the rest of the, some of the adjacent houses in the R1 district. The front view of the house from Grandview Road. And this is the view from below on Spring Street. Um, the, the trees that are right on the edge of the street, um, that's some of the other trees that are on the, the site as well. Uh, the, the planning department felt that the proposal could meet the four variance criteria. Um, so that is for the board to deliberate. Um, so with that, are there uh, questions from the board in regards to this application? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cardelli. Uh, I just have one question. I, I know in the, um, in the zoning memo, uh, it mentions that the access uh, is unchanged, but uh, I was wondering if the applicant could explain, um, are, are, you're not asking for a new curb cut off of Spring Street, right? It, it comes off, off of your existing driveway access to the carport. That's correct. Access would be off the right side of the driveway, creating a bit of a T, but uh, separated by a grass barrier. To Got it. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, it's my understanding from what you said er that Mr. Thomas said earlier that the trailer that is being protected is already there on the site. Is that true? Not. That is correct. Yes. Does it have any other means of protecting it, uh, or is it just open to the air? It, it's open to the air right now, and there is a canopy of trees over it that are quite high and unable to be trimmed too severely. So there is the potential for damage. Hence is there a? Uh, are there things like sometimes when you walk down the street, you see people who've got tarpaulins or other kinds of things like that to protect uh, otherwise open driveways? Uh, is, is, have you looked at that? Is that an available option for you? It, it is potentially for the summer, but during the winter months when the snow load would be quite heavy on our, uh, it's an old Airstream in 1975. Uh, we wouldn't be able to keep the sun shades or tarps up and elevated due to the snow load that would occur. How, how long have you had this trailer? Uh, I've had the trailer for seven years, uh, rebuilt from the ground up. It is, uh, it is our baby and our, our favorite pastime with the kids is uh, taking it out camping. Has it, has it incurred any damage so far? Uh, no, we've had some limbs fall on it, but no damage. Uh, or dense to it so far. So Mr. Chairman, I, the reason I'm asking all of this is to try to explore a little bit, my view at least of what, which is different from the planning department's view as to what it means to have a substantial hardship. Uh, the literal application of the bylaw either means that Mr. Thomas would have to spend extra money uh, in the way the planning department was contemplating or he'd have to forego having the structure. Um, and so the question ultimately is whether or not the structure, the not having the structure is a, uh, is a substantial hardship within the meaning of the, of the, of section 40A, um, or whether the structure is just a, a, a convenience that otherwise uh, that 
is, that is not a substantial hardship. And so the question really ultimately is how big of a hardship is it to forego having uh, a structure of this kind? Um, ultimately, according to the law, at least, the individual problems or individual harms that relate to the particular use of the property by a particular owner don't count. Uh, because who knows, some, one of these days, Mr. Thomas may not own that this, this anymore, or he may not own the trailer anymore, and you'll still have the carport. So there's an objective standard for this. Um, and I, I'm undecided on this point. Uh, at this point, without having heard the rest of the hearing, I don't know what I feel on all the other points. It seems to me that there's a strong case that whatever the problem here is, it's due to shaped topography and so forth, so that we get past condition one. Um, but I need to understand better why the hard, why the hardship that is would be involved in not having the carport uh, is the sort of substantial hardship that uh, that would justify a variance. Yeah, and if, if I may, for one minute, just uh, bring back that, uh, you know, potential damage from the overhead canopy is significantly uh, possible. We just had the microburst, a large limb did drop down with a 12 inch diameter nearby. Uh, you know, and storing the camper off site is not an option really due to the financial uh, costs associated with that, upwards of six to $900 a month, uh, 900 for covered within about 30 miles from here. So we can't afford that one. Uh, so it is mostly as a protection. It's the only parking cover we would have in that area. The garage is quite small and not accessible for, for any vehicles other than a, a very small one. So it does provide protection to uh, our property. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what would the height be of this proposed carport? It is 12 feet at the sides and uh, 13 point, I believe it was 13 feet, two inches at the peak. And that gives sufficient clearance for the trailer underneath? Yes, that does. The trailer height is about 12 feet, uh, three inches. So on the image that we had seen before of the trailer piece, not anticipated that the canopy would be significantly taller than what we're seeing in this image. Yes, it would. Uh, there would be that that foot and a half for the trusses to go up under underneath the uh, roof structure. So it would be about a foot and a half taller than what you're seeing now. And the access to it would be through the existing driveway where the truck is parked today? Yes, that's correct. And then a, a gate will go up across on the right there. So it would all be covered. Okay. But this fence here would fence. essentially remain unchanged. That's correct. The, uh, the, the actual area, I think the six foot line is, is about two and a half feet on the other side of that fence. Further questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? DuPont. So I just have a question if I could pose it to Mr. Valorelli. Um, and um, Mr. Valorelli, are you, are you there? I am, Mr. DuPont, go right ahead. Um, so if, if there was a proposal to put a, a garage in, in roughly the same location, Right. What, what would we be dealing with in terms of the setbacks? He has um, a pre. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah. He has a pre-existing non non-conforming front yard setback of 15 uh, plus feet, so we would have to maintain that. And in the rear yard setback for an accessory structure, he'd have to maintain a six foot setback. So it would be 15 to, um, to spring. That's correct. So what the applicant is asking the board is if he can seek relief from the 15 foot setback, which is pre-existing non-conforming, which he could do by right uh, and get a little closer. I see. Okay. So we're, we're really now talking about 
the difference between 15 and six point something? That is absolutely correct, Mr. DuPont. Um, okay. And then I, I just want to be clear because I know that the planning board memo uh, says 25 feet, and I, I think the difference has been explained. Um, so I think it would be the 15. Um, but it does talk about not only the financial, but the environmental cost. And so I'm just um, asking the applicant, Mr. Thomas, to address what the environmental cost is. I think I understand what it might be, but could he, could you please address that, Mr. Thomas? Yes, of course. Uh, the, the area is all uh, currently pavered, so there would be a no additional impervious cover added. The canopy is, is high enough that no additional tree trimming or tree removal would be required. And I do plan on putting a, a rain catchment system on it, which would actually reduce the runoff that occurs down Spring Avenue a bit from the property. And, and to the extent that the planning board memo indicates that were you to try to adhere to the 15 foot uh, distance from Spring, it said that there would be an environmental cost to doing it that way. So I'm just trying to understand what that environmental cost would be. Yes, if on the left side, those trees would have to be removed and we would have to jackhammer out the ledge. There is a five foot rise occurring over to there. Uh, it's currently, you have, it's I'd say 21 feet from the property line. Hence with the six foot setback and the 14 foot carport, that would leave about a foot off of that, the, the ledge in existing. Well, the trees are back a little further. They're, they're into the landscaping and on the ledge there. So it would be required to uh, excavate out uh, the ledge in that area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just to... <clears throat> clarify a, a point there. So the existing, so in the R1 zoning district, the minimum required front yard setback is 25 feet, but this house has a pre-existing non-conformity of having a front yard depth of only 15 feet. So I misunderstood that um, initially, so I did just want to clarify that point. Um, and so basically the applicant is looking to reduce the, uh, the front yard setback uh, from 15 feet to six feet, uh, which is uh, from which is already in a pre, which are, is already a non-conforming setback. Uh, further questions from the board? None. I'm going to stop and share here. <clears throat> Go ahead and open the meeting for public comment. So um, in opening the meeting for public comment, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You will be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair, and please remember to speak clearly. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has ended, the public comment period will be closed. Board and staff will do our best to show documents that um, are being discussed. So with that, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to this particular item? Board, I do not see see any, but I will ask again, are there any members of the public who wish to address the board in relation to uh, this application um, for 24 Grandview Road? Seeing none, I will 
close the public comment period for 24 Grandview Road. Uh, so what is before the board here then, um, I do want to try to clarify this a little bit um, <clears throat> because the, the board has some discretion of if there's a, an existing nonconformity and an applicant is seeking to um, basically increase the level of the nonconformity, uh, then the board has some dis has discretion to act under state law um, and to grant it as long as there is not as it is not um, significantly more detrimental. However, if there's a new nonconformity that is being proposed or um, something that creates a new conflict with the zoning bylaws, and that requires a variance. So, so I did want to um, just quickly, Mr. Valerelli, if I could um, just confirm this. So um, the creation of, so the, do we have any documentation of allowing the creation of the front yard parking area? Uh, we do, Mr. Chairman. The, the applicant due diligence uh, resubmitted his application in the variance form. Okay. So is there an existing, so the, the parking that, that parking space that's currently being utilized in that front yard facing Spring Street. So that parking area is not permitted at the moment. Is that correct? That's a great question. So the, um, the, the structures or the parking areas, if you will, are um, based on does it have a roof or does it not? So a driveway um, would be allowed by right um, with the new bylaw change with a minimum buffer. But because this particular structure has a roof, the, uh, the board has to look at this as if it was a garage, if you will. Uh, so therefore, that's why the applicant is before the board. So ISD looks at structures roofed or unroofed. In fact, it's written in the zoning bylaw several times with that description. So the applicant is looking for uh, basically a carport instead of a driveway. And that's what he's asking the board uh, for relief from. If the applicant came before ISD and maintained a 15, uh, 15 point, whatever it is, one foot setback and maintained that pre-existing non-conforming setback, he might be issued a building permit by right, but because he can't, because of topography reasons, uh, what I'm hearing tonight, uh, he needs our relief for that. I hope I answered your question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, yes. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I, there's, there was another implication, I think, in the Chairman's question that I wanted to focus on. One way of looking at this is as an intensification, as an ex or the extension of an existing nonconformity. That it's already nonconforming to 15 feet. Now they want it nonconforming to six feet. Uh, and I can see reasons one way or the other why you might regard it that way. But why wouldn't this be a extension of the existing nonconformity? So my sense is that there's there's two issues going on. That one is the um, is the setback issue, so the reduction of the existing nonconformity to fifteen from fifteen feet to six feet. The other is this question about creation of a front yard parking space. So Arlington does not allow the creation of parking within the front yard. Um, this is a little bit of a quirky situation where there is an existing parking area that. Um, has existed at this property and is currently being utilized for parking. But the question about whether or not there is a record of it being allowed to be parking or whether it predates um, this provision of the zoning bylaw, law, we really don't know. Um, and that's part of what I'm a little uncertain about is are we being asked to not only allow the structure, but are we also being asked to um, allow the, the use of the front yard for parking in this, in this case, which would require the variance. If it was just a question of can the, you know, can the, the, can the setback be reduced, then I believe that would be a, a, a section six determination that the board can make. But 
is the fact that there's parking involved within the front yard does that therefore make it um, that it need to is that you know part of the basis for the variance request and in this case where it's you know it's it's an existing it's basically an existing front yard use um, that the board has no knowledge of how it was created I, I don't know if that creates an issue for us or not mr chairman uh, <clears throat> the issue really it seems to me the issue with respect to the parking i mean the applicant is allowed once he's got a driveway there to park wherever he wants mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a regulation issue in that the question is whether or not this would be sufficient to require the to meet the parking standards of the of the zoning bylaw and the rule is is that is that that, that those things don't count you you can't have the regulation parking located uh, located there um, and i'm not sure that that issue is really before us uh i mean suppose we said no uh, does that mean he's the applicant is supposed to remove his trailer and cars, your truck? Uh, presumably not. Um, so I, I at least am a lot more concerned about the about the six feet than I am about the fact that this is being used um, for parking at all. But I, I may be be wrong on that now, because the house itself, whatever it is, is already has something uh it was approved there were parking probably parking requirements uh at the time it was originally went in and either this was before that or uh it, or it it met whatever it was it's a little bit too late now to reopen that Mr. Hanlon, do you think this is a less of a case of a variance requirement and more of a section six determination or is this well, I'm, I'm attracted to the idea. Let me just say that if we had a choice, if we could look at it either way, and and it was a matter of judgment, I'd re much rather treat this as a Section Six application because it would focus our attention on what ought to be the right considerations, and the kind of worries I had about substantial hardship that I expressed earlier wouldn't be relevant, and we'd be just looking at land use sorts of things and not looking at the sort of quasi-constitutional issues that gave rise to variances to begin with. Um, so if it could be done as a special permit and, and that is open to us, I think it would be a preferable way to go. Members of the board. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Hanlon said, you know, if he has a driveway, you know, once a driveway is there, he can park wherever he can. But um, I have a question, for Mr. Valorelli. Doesn't a driveway have to extend past the front of the house? So the intention is to pat that the parking could be past the front of the house. Is that true, Mr. Uh, Valerelli? It does, Mr. Mills. That's that's absolutely correct. So this is not a legal driveway in any sense of the word, then? As it stands. Just clarifying the issue. Thank you. So essentially, the driveway needs to lead to legal parking um, by definition. And in this case, the driveway does not lead to legal parking. Um, except for the parking that is uh, under the house. Um, and so in that regard, uh, Mr. Hanlon, does that change your opinion about what we're trying to accomplish? Well, it's troubling. Um, I mean, I, the record isn't... Oh, I I think it's troubling, although it doesn't really directly issue, deal with the issue that that I'm concerned with. In other words, as the chairman pointed out, uh, this does involve two distinct issues. One is the location of the parking, where 
which has got a dis distinct set of considerations, and the other has to do with the extension of the existing nonconformity that comes from from essentially intruding more into the protected front yard. Um, we could solve that last part, it seems to me, by treating it as an extension of existing nonconformity, and there would be some good practical sense in doing so. It doesn't necessarily deal with the second issue, but I'm not sure, I mean, we don't have an application in front of us really that is dealing with the second issue. We haven't heard any any real argument on it except the discussion that we're having now, which we all made up ourselves. And, I, and the applicant surely wasn't expecting when he filed this application to suddenly define, suddenly find himself having to vigorously defend the existence of his driveway. Um, so I'm a little bit perplexed as to what to do about it and nervous about dealing with this kind of an issue on the fly. Uh, the fact that it exists and has existed from some time suggests to me that there's some sort of a vested interest in it, which I'd like to be able to explore more. Uh, but I'm near, it, it troubles me to suddenly entertain this other this the, this issue uh and without having much of a basis for it without having i mean i i would like very much to get more information about how this got to be here and why it's here and so on if it's a mistake by if it was a mistake by isd or its predecessors earlier on there are provisions about how long you can have to challenge those things all of those are things that have not been developed on our record that i'd be reluctant to to jump into right now. So from my perspective, the, the board has had several applications recently uh, for variances in regards to parking. Um, on Avenue, there was a prior one on Summer Street. Um, I think has done a fairly good job of sort of exploring these and discussing them, especially as they relate to public safety. Um, and the necessity of the of the property and the you know, sort of how those those work together. Um, and in some ways, I'm a little more comfortable in in regards to the the application um, to say that you know the that the board could consider um, you know the location for the structure as a various criteria um, and then structure itself would just be a section six determination because they're essentially trying to step back. Um, creation of a new structure under uh, great variance, I guess you know, at that point is sort of you know, besides this whole point of doing Mr. Chairman, I at least I'm having a hard time hearing you. Well I'll oh, take your pardon. Um I was just There, um, the where the board has experience in regards to experiences for parking, I feel a little more comfortable for discussing and using this parking area as a doing that discussion on, as a variance. The question about the structure and then the, the structure, then just an extension of that same conversation, or is it a separate? Sense is that it would all be sort of part of the same piece, um, but the and then the question really becomes: Does the board have sufficient information for the record to satisfy the request for a variance? Um, there are certainly attestations in regards to the remainder of the site, um, how the site goes up, how the site falls away, um, but the trees on the site. And the documentation we have for that uh, is included in the images and in the, the planning department memo. And those are sort of the basis for the first of the four variance criteria. So if we're comfortable with that record, um, we should continue um, along the lines of a variance at this time. If, the board thinks we need additional information or uh, is, is concerned about that, then we should 
figure out what it is that the board would need it to be able to reach that decision. Mr. Chairman? DuPont. So when I went by, I did not look at the driveway per se. So is there at the end of the driveway, I'm sorry, did somebody just refer to the fact that there's parking underneath? Mr. Thomas? Yes, there is a, uh, it is an exposed basement. So the basement is partially uh, buried, but not on that side because it slopes down and it's exposed. There is a small carport there, not carport, sorry, a small garage okay. under the house. Okay, so so that's that extends beyond the driveway, obviously. The driveway leads to that uh, garage space. So not to get too far into the weeds here, but as I'm listening to other members of the board, I mean, it, it, it sounds like if you have a driveway and it is there and has been there for a period of time, yet there's no record of how it got there in the first place, because there's no finding that it was either in conformity with whatever the regulations were at the time that the house was constructed, or there's no variance request saying that we need to be able to park here because of the placement of the house on the lot. Um, and I'm not sure that that's actually true, but in having looked at the lot, it does seem to me that there might be some merit in arguing for a variance for a driveway. And I'm not suggesting that that's what I think that the applicant should do now, but I'm just trying to think this through. So if there is either no record of how the driveway got there, um, are we looking to see then in order to make a determination um, how it got there? Because is it not logical that if we believe that the driveway is there, but we're not sure whether it's appropriately there, that we can't move to the next step, which is the analysis as to whether it's an extension of an existing nonconformity? Is that, Mr. Hanlon, is that how you see it? Yes. Okay. So it strikes me that we need more information, unfortunately, about that point, if we're going to treat it as an extension of an existing nonconformity. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So to argue against what I, if we don't treat it as an existing nonconformity, then it's up to us to define what the scope of the variance is, what we're varying. Uh, and I, I suppose we could just in an abundance of caution, if we were disposed to grant this, uh, extend the variance to include the driveway also so that the whole kit and caboodle is suitably protected and there's a record of it for the future. And there, there at least is a, is a uh, practical advantage to proceeding in that way. You know, I have to say that at the, on the basis of what I've heard so far, I'm pretty comfortable with either a variance or with the extension or with the other theory of extending a non-conforming use. Um, the primary problem, I do think that there is some issue with respect to the variance that I'm more or less satisfied with, but I hate to stick precedents out there on the variance because you know they're influenced a lot by the influ by what happens at these hearings and afterwards they don't necessarily line up very well and um but that being said i could go either way and i'm not i'm not neither neither thing makes me feel as if i ought to vote to deny this application on the basis of what we've heard so far mr chairman no <clears throat> following up with pat and Mr. Hanlon's analysis on precedence. Um, I think us allowing um, someone to build a driveway in the front of their house and making it legal by variance, et cetera, could be set, uh, setting a dangerous precedent. And uh, other people could come marching in and say, they want to start building driveways and you allowed it here. Why can't I have one? Uh, I really am sympathetic to the applicant's uh, proposal, but, you know, once we say one person can do it, 
there's no stopping anybody else from doing it. And uh, then the zoning by, uh, code has basically got huge holes in it. Just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that would, the, the board would need to very carefully consider the first criteria for variance. Um, what are the, the circumstances particular to this plot, but not affecting generally the land in the district? Agreed. That would lead to this decision. And I think the board would need to make up, you know, a, a strong and definitive finding in that regard to make sure um, that the board is clear for the reasons it is acting the way it's acting on this application where it may not act similarly on other applications. Right, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, so in light of that, I just can say where I am personally on this is that I, when I went out to go look here, I didn't look with this in mind. And I am not 100%. I, mean, I, I it, it may be that I had the opportunity to, to, to study this, but I hadn't, I didn't do it. Uh, so that makes me reluctant to face this issue tonight. Um, the second thing is... I'm still a little bit hung up by having, but this is this may be an illegal driveway. I don't know whether it is or not, um, but it, I'm guessing it's been here for quite some time. Uh, certainly, at least seven years, because Mr. Thomas has had his trailer on it for seven years. And sorry, it, just to clarify that we we moved in a year ago. Uh, we've had the camper for seven. Oh, years. I see. Okay, well then. <laughs> I, I just wonder how long it's been there because if it was, it's, it seems to me more likely to be a mistake uh, on the part of the town government if it's illegal rather than a bootleg driveway that somebody stuck there because, when he didn't have any driveway before and was just park, parking on the street. It's just a guess on my part. But if it was, in fact, a permit, uh there was a building permit and this was and that was part of it and it's more than a certain distance of difference away in terms of time then it can't be challenged anymore and i don't regard what's happening now as an intensification of that use and so to me it, that issue would then go away it would be an, another these things happen all the time uh and eventually there's peace it doesn't make it right it doesn't give you the right to extend it necessarily but uh, but it does it does remove it from the list of precedents that we might be concerned about. And I don't really know anything about how long that driveway has been there and why it was there and where it was put there. And none of the rest is, is in, probably even Mr. Thomas doesn't know that. And I, and I doubt that we've looked. I mean, if I may, interestingly, there are three driveways off of Spring. I am one of, of three. So precedence was set at some point, and it is an existing uh, garage that was built into the house uh, with the existing stone. So I would say from 1937, there has been access there. And if that's true, then I don't know why we, we're dealing with this. I mean, at that point, either it's a prior nonconforming use, or if it's not, it's been there for such a long time that it's no longer subject to challenge. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. Yes, but what's being proposed here is not simply maybe um, a driveway that is non-conforming. You're looking at a building, a garage, if you will, that's gonna be built uh, in that area. So again, uh, the variance would have to be very tightly written to make sure we're not setting precedent for people building garages right on their property lines, if you will. No, absolutely. Um, Mr. Valerelli, do you know what the, the time period is uh, to a, after which a, a uh, you know, something is constructed after which point it's allowed to stay by law? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't. So the question before the board tonight, if I may, is Mil uh, Mr. Mills is um, very accurate. Because the applicant is proposing a roofed carport, it is, it, it is not the same as a driveway uh, front yard parking. It is, in fact, a garage. So I think the board should consider 
that this carport has four walls and a garage door. I think that is the question posed before uh, the board. Uh, it, it, if in fact the applicant was to extend just a driveway, um, we wouldn't be here tonight. So I hope that helps you uh, navigating your decision. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Mr. Chairman, if I may, just following up on that a second, um, I had been envisioning that we would that if we condition if we granted a variance, we would condition it on a carport so that it didn't somehow someday become a garage, um, and uh, and it wasn't just a matter of allowing any kind of of structure there. I will point out that the defense that Mr. Thomas made for why it is there is a substantial hardship, that is to say, protecting the trailer would apply equally well if he was proposing to build a garage, uh, and conceivably so with the the first consideration, we would be then looking at whether a garage was inconsistent with the purpose of the zoning ordinance, and we'd be looking at uh, whatever adverse effect there might be on the neighborhood, and those would become relatively more important. Um, but I certainly take Mr. Mills's point that the next applicant may be proposing a garage, and it needs to be quite clear why it is that we don't think, assuming that we don't think a garage is appropriate, what the reason for that might be. So is the, this is the, I think I had a phrase this here. Um, so this, the substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the partitioner, to the petitioner, um, is that in the absence of a carport, their vehicle is, um, is open to the sky um, or open to the trees above or whatnot. Um, so the nature of that substantial hardship is that the it puts um, this this vehicle in jeopardy. Is that the the understanding of the nature of the hardship? That's my understanding, and of course, garages do that too. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Dupont. So that that's sort of a difference for me because when somebody says I want to put up a garage but I can't because of topography or soil condition whatever it is I don't know that we look at the rationale for a garage we don't say because cars uh, need to be protected from the weather and therefore we need a garage we just say, well, garages are permissible. And generally speaking, you have to have them located, you know, within these uh, dimensions from the, you know, the rear and the side and the front yards. So I, I guess I have a little conceptual difficulty in looking at this and saying that the hardship is the damage, potential damage to the trailer because I agree, I think it's a garage, you know. I don't know, I looked for the word carport in the bylaw and I didn't see it. So I'm not sure what we term it to say we're allowing, you know, fill in the blank. You know, it's an accessory structure of some sort. It's I accessory guess. structure. Right. So we've got an accessory structure, but do we generally speaking look at what the rationale is for wanting the accessory structure? Or do we say, you know, there's a generally accepted valid reason for wanting this. And now we have to deal with the dimensional requirements and whether or not the, you know, conditions and criterion one are, are uh, satisfied with respect to the placement. And that to me is the issue. I'm not so worried about whether it's a boat, a trailer, a car, um, because I think it's a garage or it's an accessory structure, but nonetheless, the use is pretty much the same. So I don't see the hardship as the damage to the particular vehicle or whatever that is, as much as I just see like somebody wants to put this there 
is there enough of a reason to allow a permitted structure to be placed here based upon the criterion uh, number one? Um, Mr. Thomas, do you have, a, a, looking at the drawings, do you have dimensions for the carport? I don't see dimensions listed. Yes, that was uh, submitted as well. I don't think it made it into your packet, but it is 14 feet wide and 26 feet long. It, it fits onto that uh, existing pavered area. Okay, thank you. And, and you had said it was, uh, essentially 13 foot two, I believe. Yes. So with the information the board has in front of it, um, do, we, is, do we feel comfortable proceeding with the direct discussion of the, the four criteria for variance, or do we feel we need to, um, to request some additional information, or is there <clears throat> concern that the variance is not the, what we should be proceeding along the lines? My sense, at, my sense at this point is that you know, there's a general consensus that a variance is what's required. Uh, we would need to be careful in crafting the wording of the variance. Um, and it really comes down to the question of, do we feel that the four criteria for variance are met? And if we feel the four criteria are met, then we can um, stipulate specifically issues related to the size, the materiality, whether the sides are enclosed, um, those kinds of criteria. But the real question is, do, are the four criteria for variance met in such a way that we can, we can proceed beyond this point? Mr. Chairman? Yes. So if I had more time and I could get answers somehow to the questions about how long that driveway has been there. And I think as has been suggested, if it was there pursuant to a building permit that was lawfully issued many years ago, then there's, I think, the, I think it's 10 years, if I remember correctly, from the time that a permit is issued, uh, that somebody can come in and can challenge and say that was in, you know, that was in, in, incorrectly uh, granted that permit. But whatever the period of time is, I suspect that it's long before that. And I, I do wonder how the other board members feel because if we were to determine that in fact, it was a longstanding driveway that was part of an initial submission and approval, then I think we do have the opportunity to look at it as an extension of a pre-existing non-conforming use. And I, I do think to me that that's perhaps a better alternative to consider. Perhaps we don't get to that, but that would be my preference would be to try to have more information. Where it's gonna come from, I'm not sure, but to have more information so that we have the choice to treat it more as a special permit than a, a variance. Chairman, yes, sir. that that just to say that would be my preference as well. And we could work out and we could think in the next few weeks uh, of what would happen if we don't actually have that permit, but we are convinced that the driveway has been that been there that long that long a time. I'm not quite sure law, legally exactly what you do about that. Uh, but my recollection is that under some circumstances, it's seven years and other circumstances, it's 10 years. But obviously, this is this has almost certainly been here a long, lot longer than that. Um, then the question would be for Mr. Thomas, would you be amenable to a continuance um, to August 30th to allow the, the board um, and yourself time to try to determine the, the age of the um, that existing parking area? 
Oh, you broke up there, but I, I got the gist of that. Yes, I'm I'm fine with the continuance. Okay. Uh, so, in addition, are there any other points that the board would want to try to elucidate during this period, apart from the the tenure of that that portion of the yard? Seeing none, um, then I think I would entertain a motion to continue uh, the hearing for 24 Grand View Road until Tuesday, August 30th at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Inland. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, <coughs> so this would be a vote of the board for continuance. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mills? Aye. Mr. Cadelli? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on 24 Grandview Road. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon? Could I suggest that we we uh, consult with Mr. Heim on this as well? It would be it, it would be valuable to me at least to have his guidance on how to work our way through this. Certainly, we can discuss this with counsel. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Good evening. My name is Dean Iocomedes. I'm representing John and Althea Iocomedes, mm -hmm. and I'm also here with Savina Iocomedes. Um, I understand we're on the agenda. Um, Am I keeping her up too late? Is there any way we could uh, switch us next just because it's getting late and she likes to be, she would like to be in the meeting? <laughs> um, then I would uh, oh, ask the Wilmer if they would. I'm, I'm sorry? I was just asking the, to the Wilmers or the, oh. would be next, but they have, they are fine with doing that. Yep. Um, so in that case, we will move to the next. Thank you very item. much. We appreciate that. Certainly. So then the next item we would take up would be docket number 370812 Prospect Avenue. Um, so with that, I will uh, bring up the documentation for that. But in the meantime, I can ask you to uh, introduce yourself and tell us what um, you are interested in doing. So um, my name is Dean Eichmies. I am uh, John Althea's brother. I'm also uh, their contractor. And I'm here with my client and my niece, Sabina Iocomides. She said, I am not she's, your client. She's not my client. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be translating. I'll get like, that straight. So Sabina has uh, cerebral palsy. She's uh, wheelchair bound. And right now, um, her parents... Uh, bring her up and down the stairs every day. Her bedroom's upstairs. Um, we are uh, <clears throat> proposing to build a um, uh, handicap suite for Savina. So it'd be a, a bedroom, a bathroom, an entranceway, a mud room, so she could put all her uh, apparatus and gear um, coming in and out of her existing handicap. Well, you do have some gear. Your chairs, your, your standard. So um, that's our proposal. Um, I understand we're encroaching into the uh, side yard. A portion of the addition is encroaching into the side yard. Um, I lose you. Oh, no. okay. <clears throat> So this is the <laughs> that's the existing correct and then the proposed structure is right there yeah on the front we got 11 three I think or 11 two um, and on the back is eight two so I mean the yard there's plenty of uh, room on the yard just uh, we try to, to remove the deck in the back and build the addition off the back. Unfortunately, what it does is just put Savino away from the rest of the family, um, which is towards the front of the house and upstairs. So it would be a far away walk or, you know, 
uh, area to get to every time they would need to get to her. Where this brings her to the front of the house um, and it's right down the bottom of the stairs, right outside her, you know, her mother and father's bedroom. Mm -hmm. I was that's right. So this is the in house. Yep. Prospect Avenue. Correct. Uh, existing first floor plan. So on the first floor, um, what are the purposes of these rooms currently? So one, one's a living room, one's a dining room right now. Okay. So the, the living room, and then that's a family room back there. Oh, okay. So, and that's a kitchen area, right where your uh, pointer is right oh, now. Oh, okay, perfect, okay. So, so what we yeah, we're gonna become, the living room's gonna become her bedroom. And then the- Went too far, sorry. Yeah, yeah right there. Um, And so at this, so essentially the property line is coming at an angle here. The property line is coming at an angle. So uh, like, I don't know, two thirds of it is encroaching um, and then the rest of it is not. Okay. You know, my understanding was that uh, a conforming lot is seven and a half foot on the setback, but I guess that's not correct. No, it's 10, 10 feet. Okay. I thought it was non-conforming 10 feet. And then up a, on the second floor level, um, proposing just a just, just a proposed master suite. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, none of that impacts the the what sets us on the 14 foot is the actual uh, layout of the bathroom and mudroom area to get the correct diameter of swing for wheelchair and the um, the shower and we as you can see we're just you know squeak squeaking by on that um so it's it's actually pretty tight on the on that 14 foot you know we wanted to go bigger but the 14 foot is just giving us what we need and then is the is the the area for the bath and the the, the foyer and the closet is that encroaching on the existing um I would say like half, uh, you know, a portion of it. So, you know, the front mudroom, no, but as you get closer to the where, where the toilet area is, um, you're probably just touching and then, you know, the rest of it goes in. So, you know, if we took the building and cut it on a diagonal, stepped it back, then it, I think architecturally it would be horrible, especially when the roof lines, you know, came up to the roof line. So. You know, it, what's driving it is the front room at that 14 feet. If we bring that in, you know, and we could bring, we could step the back, but I think just architecturally it'd be, you know, coming in from the side of the street, you could see that, you know, uh, clearly, so. And so it's, this portion here would be. That's correct. And then, um, how would, where would the access be up to the? So, see, right there, there's a ramp. There's a ramp right in front of our house right now, yep. and then it it actually comes in, swings where that the entrance is now, and then turns into the porch, and then goes across the porch. But there's a <clears throat> there's a bump on the threshold that goes into the the main house. There's a three inch bump, so they have a curve, um, and then. You know, coming into the doorway, if you look at the, the plans, it's it's really tight. Yep. Um, with this, we're going to bring the ramp flush out. We will have a zero clearance threshold. Um, and then, um, you know, she'll be able to go in and out of her own suite. Um, and, you know, she has a she has a PCA that comes in and, and helps her. Okay. Um, and it would be Perfect. They can come right in and out of the door. Um, and it just, yeah. Uh, um, 
She'll be ready for school in the morning, get on the bus, right? What time does the bus come? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. So the the new entry sequence would the porch extend in front of the new addition, or would it just be? So there'll be a little porch in front of the addition, and then the uh, handicap ramp that's not drawn in there would be uh, on there. So there's a handicap ramp that runs parallel to the porch, to the front porch, swings, there's a landing, comes over to another landing and then goes onto the porch, like right to the left of your cursor. Okay. Um, and then goes into the house. So basically we're gonna extend the landing of the ramp and then there'll be a little porch coming into the front. So but it won't, it won't come back, it won't come past the uh, setback. Okay. The front setback. Um, but I think you have addressed the question, but I did want to, to ask it again. Have you? Obviously, if the addition was 1.8 feet shorter, you wouldn't be before us at all. Um, I just wanted to make sure that that was something you had considered and that. You know, we did consider it, stepping the foundation back. Um, but then again, again, it would throw the, the roof lines off. You'd have a step back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just think it's architecturally mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I I'm not sure but technically we could kind of leave the second route the second floor back mm -hmm. in if we mm -hmm. if we wanted to legally so you know instead of stepping it out in at that point keep it clean um, you know we, we we considered making it smaller but again we couldn't we did three or four configurations of the of the bathroom Mm -hmm. And it just it just wouldn't work. Okay. Um, so and if we did it the long way, again, she'd have to go through the living room. This this just gives her she's part of the house now. It, you know, she's part of the entrance, part of the uh, hallway, and then up the stairs is her parents' bedroom and her sister, brother and sister's bedroom. So it just she it flows, she's part of the house. Um, and then she'll have her own uh, way to uh, get around uh, and, you know, she's, she has a power chair that she's getting trained on so eventually she'll be coming in and out with her own power chair um we're going to put a 42 inch uh you know front door uh probably with an ada access opener um, so as she grows she'll be able to do that and just to confirm that on this side of the house is where the driveway is. That is correct. That's where the driveway is now. Okay. So we couldn't do it that way. <clears throat> if you look on the back where it says deck, there's, a, there's an addition. And then the deck, we considered renovating it and then adding to the back, removing the deck, adding to the back, going you know further back because we've got plenty of room. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like I said, it, it throws her way another 30 feet out behind the house. Now you got to go through the living room, through the family room, through the kitchen, up the stairs. You know, so it's a, it's a far it's a far walk to you know to upstairs bedrooms or you know her parents need to hear her or whatnot. We feel that she's not part of the and then accessibility. She would have to come all the way back if we put a separate ramp down the driveway. Uh, and the elevation of that is a lot higher. The topography goes down, so the elevation. It is higher, so the ramp would be much, much longer. Right. And I, I did want I'm not to sure. I'm not sure if he's got topo on that, but it, it is. It is. I think the slopes down two or three feet. Okay. Um, I did want to bring up the memorandum from the planning department, um, and so they had looked at this and applied the variance criteria as well. Um, so I sort of note that the uh, the front porch would be extended. Um, the addition would extend the footprint at the left 
into oh, the yeah. setback where it's currently not. Um, a decrease the setback from 25 to 8 feet, 8.1 or 8.8 by the appellant. Um, whereas 10 foot is the minimum uh, result increase in square footage from 1,825, um, uh, which is less than 750 square feet. So it's not a, considered a large addition. Uh, however, the proposed gross floor area is not provided staff notes. If the total increases over 750, then a special permit would be needed in addition. Um, under the proposal, lot coverage would increase to approximately 20.7%, but that does not include the four yeah. um, structures. R1 does not have any existing nonconformities. So this would be creating a new nonconformity, which is a reason for a variance. Um, and as we had stated on the, the prior hearing, the, the variance criteria are set under state law. There are four criteria and the board needs to be able to um, find all four criteria in order to be able to, um, to accept the, the variance. So the first one is, um, Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. Is the fact that we're dealing with a disability here um, impinge on um, this issue? Is there uh, some law that would uh, impact on this decision? Do need the architects know? No. I would ask Mr. Valarelli if he's aware of anything. I'm unaware of anything specific. Um, I know that the application of variance, variance criteria we're not supposed to consider a specific, um, a specific resident or a specific need of a specific resident. It's supposed to be general to the property. Um, uh, I wasn't sure, and I would ask Mr. Valarelli if it's particular to, uh, to this circumstance you want to do. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's a great question. So, I, I actually have to defer that back to you and to the architects on the board. Does the ADA or the AAB take precedence in this matter? Um, a, an analogy would be if a person came to the building department to put in an accessible yes. ramp and it uh, looking at it at face value needed a variance? Well, it would not because it in fact helps the uh, person who needs assistance to get from point A to point B and that would be by right. Um, so this is a little bit above my pay grade. So I have to defer to the architects to look at the AAB and the ADA standards uh, and make an assessment if this may be applicable to that. Uh, Mr. Mills, great point. Thank you. I don't think, I'm trying to remember now, I don't think the uh, architectural access board requirements specifically relate to single family housing. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I, I agree. I think, I, um, it, at least in my experience, ADA is uh, for public spaces and public buildings. Um, and then FHA would um, determine, you know, uh, housing development. Um, I, I'm not aware of a specific uh, law that would apply to single family uh, residential uh, in terms of accessibility. Um, but I, you know, I may not know every single one. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Riccadelli. I appreciate that. Um, so the, the memorandum that was prepared by the planning board does not, um, I do not believe it specifically addresses uh, that question. Um, so there, they say that the soil conditions, shape, topography, the lot do not limit opportunities for expansion in a manner that conforms to the current dimensional requirements. So as the applicant has himself has noted, there's room in the front, there's room on the right, there's room on the rear, and there is um, uh, a shy of 12 feet of space um, or just over 12 feet of space uh, to the left that they could expand and stay within, within the requirements of the zone bylaw. Um, and there's but that there are specific 
um, desires in regards to the interior layout of the house that are driving the determine the decision to locate it on that side of the house. Um, uh, for hardship, the additional primary family member um, who needs a wheelchair, though, the setting of the house on the lot limits the opportunities for expansion into the side yards. It's likely the proposal could be revised to comply with the metro requirements. However, substantial modifications to the existing structure may be necessary given the need to construct an additional living area that meets accessibility standards, which could be cost prohibitive. Um, criteria three is without substantial detriment to the public good. Um, proposal of the dish would encroach by 1.9 feet, but would otherwise be in character with the abutting homes. Uh, the property, the property can accommodate the addition without compromising the public good. Um, and uh, the planning department felt that without uh, derogating from the intent of the bylaw, that it's consistent with R1 housing and trying to um, allow the housing for all of Arlington's residents uh, within the residential neighborhood. Uh, so this is an image from above, so you can see that this is the location for the addition uh, with the driveway here on the side. The front. This is an image from the front of the house. This will be here in this grassy portion on the side. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon, sorry. Um, it just, I want to be clear that this is a two story addition. There's a second story on top of it. Yeah. And certainly, in terms of what it looks like, and I, and I dropped by there just before our meeting today, uh, there's, there's sort of a house just on the other side of where this picture is. Um, and a two story structure there um, is something that, that, might occasion some some question. Um, I guess it would be interesting to hear what 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 abutters have to say about that. But I wouldn't necessarily assume that 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 is a non-issue. No, absolutely. Um, the recommendation for the Department of Planning and Community Development was that they, it is their opinion that it does not meet criteria one. Uh, and they're uncertain about criteria too. Okay, Mr. Chairman, can I, I, I the a application form is, that we have is very perplexing because uh, the numbers on the dimensional requirements are not filled in for the proposed. Although there's a statement that says how many square feet, extra square feet this is, uh, there's no support for that. You see, there's none of it is filled out except the existing, and on some occasions in the existing, like lot coverage, the figure is clearly, is clearly wrong, because if you do the arithmetic from what's there, you get 15% instead of 10%. And it, it, it's, it's a, I, this is an extraordinary sympathetic case, but, but we're dealing with information that I don't have, I don't trust, uh, and that doesn't really fill it all out. One of the issues that's raised by the planning department is how big this is. Uh, we have a statement that it's here that it's gross square footage is, goes from 18 to 25, which would be 700. But the next page, which is where we normally calculate that, isn't filled out. So there's no way to verify that. If you do the arithmetic, looking at some of the drawings, it looks like it's somewhat more than certainly more than 700 and possibly more than 750. And I just am not entirely clear on, uh, we just don't have the, we don't have the facts that we normally have to make these, to make these judgments. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm perplexed by that. And I guess as long as I've got the floor, I'll say I'm also somewhat perplexed and I will rely a lot on the architects on the, the contention that this couldn't be uh, built with in compliance with the with the the zoning bylaw. You know, I look at it; it's attractive emotionally, but we're not supposed to be looking at the particular conditions of the particular people who want to do this. And so, th to me, it's a building; uh, it's an extension; it's an addition to the side of the building. Um, 
if there's some special category that relates to building for the handicap that uh, then sort of takes it out of that category in some way, which is what we were exploring before, that would be very relevant. But otherwise, it seems to me there has to be some way in which there's a hardship, a hardship that's cognizable under the zoning bylaw, under the state law that allows th this intrusion. Uh, and it's it's hard to so I'm going to step back because I don't, it, it reminds me of the Venner Road case we had before, which was very sympathetic, but ultimately it came down to the applicant going back to his mom and saying that the Board of Zoning Appeals are a bunch of hard nosed people and maybe there's a way out of this and mom said yes and i'm i'm curious as to whether if you really put your mind to it there's not a way of solving this problem uh that that will enable the needs of the applicant to be met and at the same time not require a deviation from the zoning bylaw mr Hamlin, um i would ask the applicant is there do you have a version of this that is actually filled out completely? Uh, I believe so. I believe it was uh, all submitted. Um, as far as the square footage, the addition is uh, you know 14 by 27. So you're talking about 378 square feet downstairs. And then the roof lines come in uh, on the second floor, way in. Um, so you're, you're talking about, you know, maybe 20 by 14, another 280 square feet. So you're under 700 already on that. Um, again, you know, uh, by, by right, we have the ability to, to, to build the front to the 14, right to the 10. We could step it back, kick it over, and then can leave the second floor back out to the 14 and, you know, maintain that. But again, I think architecturally, that's not the correct uh, thing to do to this house. I mean, you know, it's not a historical house, but it, it does have some character. It's been here for a long time. Um, it's been in the family since, you know, 87. So, you know, we take pride in the house and the land. Um, and, um, you know, we believe that, you know, for Savina's sakes, this is what she needs um, mm -hmm. for, for an extra foot and a half if we have to shrink it. And she's banging her knees when she's, you know, older, trying to, you know, maneuver her power chair. Um, I don't think that's that's correct. So the addition is fourteen by twenty-eight, correct? Not fourteen by twenty-seven. Twenty-seven or twenty-eight? Should be twenty-seven. Twenty-eight on all the drawings. So okay, so twenty-eight. I apologize. I mean, I think this is part of this is part of the issue that the board is having is that um, I don't know if. But, but you're still way under your 700. It's very correct that, you know, this is the documentation that was provided to the board, which yeah. this is incomplete. It makes our job very difficult to determine exactly how we should proceed. Um, and so if, if this is not the record that you submitted, then we, that's something we need to determine. But if this is the information that was provided. It might be, it might be what we submitted. And if it is missing, uh, uh, items, I guess we could go back and do it. But again, uh, if, if you do the math, um, it, it's just a, you know, a 14, or even at 14 by 28. And again, upstairs, the roof lines come way in. Habitable is, is way in, it's 16 feet. If you, if you get to the habitable uh, space on the second floor, because of the roof lines, the, the, the second floor, the roof sits on the second floor um, I think it sits on a one foot, two foot knee wall. So by the time you come out to the, to the five foot mark, you've come in eight feet on both sides. So in reality, it's a very small room up there. It's probably 12 by 14. So you're way under your 700 square foot mark. Um, whether I put it on paper or not. There's no information on the drawings that provides that information to us. Yep. Um, and but you can see it. I mean, it's, it's for, for us to make a decision that you know is legally binding. We need to have figures that we can legally hold to. And okay. right now, it's very fungible as to what the proposal actually is. Um, but but it, it it couldn't be because of the roof, the roof where the roof line sits. You know, just you couldn't have habitable space. There's no second floor walls on the roof. But there's no roof pitch. It's a yeah, fine. 
if there's no roof oh, biscuit. But it's a, even at even at a 12, 12, you're you're again, you're there's no knee wall, there's no walls that those roof is sitting on. It's mm -hmm. sitting on the basically a foot off the second floor. So you habitable, you know, is I think is a 12 by 12 or 14 by 14 room. You're way under your 750 square feet. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think you can be sympathetic to our position. Um, you know, we need to have, we're, whatever decision the board makes has to be yeah. transmitted to the registry yeah. of deeds. And that's, that's fine. We, the we legal can, document. So we need actual. Th real. That's fine. We can, if, if they're incomplete, we can definitely come back and fill that out and give you a complete drawing showing mm -hmm. that, um, you know, but th that's not an issue. Okay. So uh, I think then then it sort of comes back to this to you know sort of the, the primary ish question, which is that this is a request for a variance. That's uh, correct. And I think the, the real question before the board, and as Mr. Hanlon had had said, you know, it was sort of the question on Venner Road as well, is where you have a site where you can readily develop in any direction and to, for you know what in this case is very you know very valid and very um, important reasons you are requesting to do it in a particular direction that is creating a new nonconformity. Um, the first criteria established under state law is that there is some reason that it has to that this has to happen. Um, you know, is there something about the soil conditions, the shape of the lot, or the topography, especially affecting this land, but not generally affecting the zoning district? And I, I, I think that the board is, is you know, the, the planning board certainly struggled with that question. Uh, excuse me, the planning department struggled with that question. And I think that that's, you know, something the board hasn't had an opportunity to discuss yet, but I, I, I think this is something that the board, you know, I'd like to hear from other members of the board what they feel um, in particular about this this question, because as, as was stated before, you know, the, when the board is making decisions in regards to variances, it's not supposed to be looking at specific situations with specific uh, households because the um, the variance will outlast or outlive the, the residents of the home. It'll be a permanent change to the land record. And you know, as was, as was brought up, I think it's very important that the board um, speak with council and confirm what the situation is with regards to, um, with the laws in the Commonwealth and whether there are any laws that would apply in this case because of the, re the current residents of the home. Um, but otherwise, it's a question before the board as to, you know, can we meet the requirements under state law for criteria number one? So uh, I would like to hear from other members of the board to sort of get their sense on this question. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. So, um, you know, when I read the uh, planning department memo and without having you know, come to the meeting yet, I was just looking at it in terms of the end recommendation that uh, we work with the applicant to try to determine whether there is a way of having the addition conform to the existing zoning. And, you know, I, I really do understand and appreciate and sympathize with what the applicant is saying as far as why it is desirable. And, and I really do get that. And I suspect all of the members of the board do as well. It's just that when we deal with variances as opposed to special permits, special permits, as everyone knows, we have discretion. And when we talk about variances, we don't have really discretion as far as whether or not we have to meet the criteria in the section on, for variances. And so when I'm faced with a variance and I, I don't think that it meets the criterion, in this case, particular uh, criterion number one, 
I just feel like that removes my ability to grant the relief that's requested. I just don't feel like I'm authorized unless there is that finding because you can't write a variance decision saying we're granting this relief, but it doesn't meet the, the criterion number one. And so that's my problem. I just don't know how to get around that as much as I might actually want to do that. I just don't know how that can be done. And so I think it would be important to understand whether or not there is some superseding law, you know, either state or federal that would say, you know, that under these circumstances, those dimensional requirements don't have to be met, you know, but as it stands now, I don't see how we get past criterion one. And so I would go back to what the planning department said and see if there is a possible way of designing so that that, you know, 1.9 feet can be, you know, can be uh, accommodated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Other members of the board? Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, I guess following up on that, um, it would be helpful because I believe it's not in the application currently to, for me to, to have the topographic data because I think the point that um, the length of the ramp could have to be substantially increased in other locations is relevant, but the information doesn't seem to be part of the application now for us to consider. Um, you know, that's a good point. And the other, the, uh, this is again, just kind of along those lines. Um, I, I'm also sympathetic to the point that um, reconfiguring accessible spaces, for particularly bathrooms can be very challenging. Um, I'm not sure I see quite enough information on the plan to prove that it would be impossible to reconfigure it. It would be nice, for instance, I can't quite see what the size of the bedroom is. Um, so I, I think that would also be helpful information. Approximately um, 14 by 14. Yep, that would square off the other room. <clears throat> as far as a, a topo, um, again, it would be a cost to the owners. Um, they're, you know, they're also getting some relief uh, for this. As, as you all know, this is a very expensive uh, project. Um, the topo does drop down in the back, so it would be an increase on the on the um, ramp. But I understand you don't have the information, but it would cost them money to get the survey to come out and do a topo. Um, then they would have to renovate, demo a beautiful family room that I'm actually in right now, um, and renovate that. So to to then renovate an, an addition, so you're adding a tremendous amount of cost to the house. And you're pushing um, Savina way back in the back of the house or off to the side of the house. Um, again, to get accessible to that point would be uh, very difficult. You have to go all the way down the driveway or always to the side of the house. Um, so, you know, as far as uh, avenues, we've 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 explored a, a, a tremendous amount of avenues on how to do this. Is an existing office, is an existing family room. We talked about renovating that, um, but then they would lose the family room. So then we would go in the back if we flip flopped it. But now you're going through uh, Savina's room to get to the family room. Again, not feasible. You know, she's nine now, but she's going to be 20 one day and, and, and older. Um, the plan is one of her siblings, you know, eventually to take over this home and, and stay here. I mean, we don't know what the future brings, but that's, that's the plan. But at this present time, you know, as you, you architects know, it's, it's difficult to, whether it's ADA required or not, um, it's very difficult to, you know, put a power chair in there, have her spin around and be able to get in and out of her bathroom. Eventually, the, you know, she can't stand up, she can't walk without assistance. 
So eventually you're going to have to put a, a, a chain fault where <clears throat> she's going to need uh, assistance. So uh, uh, there's another piece of equipment in that room. Um, so, you know, every, every foot matters. Again, I, I think we have the, the setback requirements um, to get to her room, but then we'd have to step it back and go up and go, and go back and then cantilever the top. I mean, we could go through all that, but for a small portion of the variance that, that we're trying to get into, um, I, I feel that um, we've exhausted all our avenues and this is, the, this is the place to go. Now, if you need some additional you know, measurements on the drawings, that's, that's a different story, but I think that's, that's small, um, you know, small measurements or small numbers to what you see here. I mean, you got 12,500 square feet on the lot. Um, so our coverage is, is way over. I mean, what, you know, just to just to clarify what the board, the, what the, the situation the board is in is that, you know, a request for a variance, the criteria are established under state law. And so we need to follow what the state criteria are. And, the, and, and, and so saying that, you know, it's, it's under two feet, it's not, you know, it's not a big deal. Unfortunately for the board, it puts us in a very compromising position if we, if we, I understand that. that. I mean, the board. I understand that. So, you know, so that, that's where we're trying to, trying to get at. And, you know, one of the things that you know, we're trying to, I think trying to impress upon you is if there is a way to make this compliant with a 10 foot yard setback that, you know, it will not only do you then no longer need the action that needed an approval of the zoning board of appeals, um, but, you know, you can do your project entirely by right and you can move forward right, you know, right away. I understand that. So, and, and, and we've thought of that, um, you know, you know certainly um, the so. board would encourage you to follow. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? I just want to sort of stress something, and that is, we're, I mean, I, I think that I foresee that there's a certain amount of additional work that needs to be done. Uh, but I just want to sort of state at the outset that I'm not sure this is not a special permit. A special permit, you sometimes can do the kinds of things that uh, Mr. Yakamides is talking about. And the and we don't have full discretion to do that here and if i can't get by criterion one relating to the shape of the lot and that looks like a big hurdle then i can't say that i can vote in favor of this and so i just want to be really clear that nobody can be sure what will happen when we come back and take a vote unless some uh, unless this is fixed and again it's the same way as Venner road it was extremely sympathetic and i'm extremely sympathetic in both cases but when you deal with variances you really are dealing with a set of strict requirements where your sympathies are in many respects not allowed to take precedence over just following it by the book so I don't think that we should, I don't know how this vote is going to be. I haven't talked to any of you except in what everyone has heard, but I can just sort of say that I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to get to yes on this and would really, really like it if by the next time we saw this, it was like the Venner Road case again and we didn't have to get to yes because it wasn't in our jurisdiction anymore. Thank you, Mr. Are there any further questions from the board at this time? Uh, Ted, um, Mr. Chair, I had one, yeah, one question. I would like to see a roof plan, um, you know, because that would also help us establish where the bridge lines are and how and how um, the front facade is going to help with the addition. Um, I know um, that's a criteria he has in mind. How you know the, making the front look good, but that would help us a little more to understand how all the roofs merge at the front. You know, um, I have a feeling that taking the two feet off in the back might actually help you. you know, and we are under seven fifty square feet. Yeah. Taking the two feet off would help me. 
No, the back in the back, um, just to remain within the setback, I meant, you know, with all oh, the roof lines, lines coming in. So, very right. If I jog the first floor, I can cantilever the second floor and bring the roof line right back out. That would still be within the setback. You'd still be constructing within the setback if you're cantilevering into the right. setback. Even on the second floor? Even on the second floor. Okay. Or eave lines are allowed to, I think eaves are allowed to extend. Uh, there's a, a list of things that specifically can extend within the side yard setback, but the second floor addition is not one of them. I would like to um, open the meeting for public comment at this time. Um, and just to uh, quickly reiterate, um, so public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Um, if you wish to speak, uh, you can digitally raise your hand from the participant tab in the Zoom application, or if you're calling in by phone, you may dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. Um, and all questions should be addressed through the chair and the board, we will do our best to show uh, whatever documents you are requesting. Uh, so if there are members of the public who wish to address the board, please go ahead and raise your hand at this point. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I would like to uh, echo uh, Mr. Hawley's comment about the roof line. I think I was having a hard time looking at the drawings um, and getting a view of what the structure really will look like with the addition because the roof lines are drawn in so lightly, almost like dimensional lines. Um, because I think when we're all done here, the, um, the structure's gonna be pretty blocky. You know? it's, it's hard to tell. I, I, I was having trouble with that. Um, and I, I think I've heard the board say in a number of ways now, some, some compromise probably is needed here. Um, and I, I think you're, you're offering that option to the applicant from what I can tell. I, I would be very surprised if it was not possible to do some, what I would guess is a minor redesign to make this fit within the dimensional requirements by right as, as one of the board members mentioned. I would be very surprised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? That's one last time. Any other members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Hearing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment for this meeting, uh, excuse me, for this hearing. Um, so with that returning to the board, um, I mean, certainly the board is, uh, it has, has asked the applicant if there's a way that they can try to find a, a, a compromise position that would allow them to avoid the need for a variance. Um, you know, several members of the board have spoken in regard to their concern about uh, whether the application meets the criteria for a variance and whether the board would be able to grant the relief that the applicant is seeking um, based on there's also been um, a couple questions raised about whether there there's other legislation, uh, whether excuse me, other legislation in place that may impact uh, the decision the board may make, and that is certainly something I would like to explore with council, um, just to, to see how that would apply in this in this situation. Um, if excuse me, if such a, a if such legislation exists, um, and. There has been some uh, some requests to uh, have asked the applicant to provide some additional dimensions um, and uh, the completed application forms for dimensions um, and area. Are there other pieces of information that the board is seeking or other recommendations for the applicant that the board would like to make at this time? Being not so that just a 
takeaways here so for the chair would be to discuss with council and we would ask the applicant uh, for uh, first to consider an alternative avoiding the need for a variance and B, um, if not, if the, or I guess in either case, um, provide more complete, more complete dimensions. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, it just, I think that this might be included in more complete dimensions, but just to make clear, uh, Ms. Hoffman asked for more information about the ramp and Mr. Holy's more information regarding the roof structures and those should be included in the task list as well. Thank you. Um, was there any, did I miss anything from the board? Mr. Chairman, I just have a question. Yeah. Um, if if um, after consulting with um, council, there is some pathway um, uh, that uh, handicap accessibility would allow some relief, is there a way that we could let the applicant know, you know, ahead of uh, the next meeting so that he is able to, you know, react to that decision? Uh. So I can reach, I'll reach out to council tomorrow. Um, and I, and just think you might need to research a little bit, but I will definitely ask um, Mr. Trellorelli to keep the, the applicant informed uh, as to what progress we make. Thank you, that's very important. I will do Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, so with that in mind, I would ask the applicant if they would be uh, amenable to a continuance um, to the next meeting of the board, which is Tuesday, August 30th. Um, so, you know, as far as uh, of uh, re replanning, we've gone through this. Um, we we've done it. The only way of, of of doing it, we'd shrink the room. The bathroom would be non-conforming. Forget about the non-conforming, because again, ADA doesn't apply to single-family homes. Um, it wouldn't be usable for her um, uh, wheelchair, and it would be uh, very tight, so she'd bang into the wall. So, uh, with the exception of um, you know, moving her to the back of the house and doing it by right or shrinking it and not, you know, her not be able to use the, the property. Um, uh, you know, I can get you topographies and get your roof lines. I don't know what that does, um, but we can get them. Um, but we will also see council too and see what, what, the, what the by right is um, for that. If not, I mean, if we have to go through this whole process, then we would just step it back to our by right, jog the jog the building, and then uh, and go from there. But I think it's uh, you know what we have to do, you know, for that is is not correct. You know, um, the, the roof lines they they're on the plans. Okay, I could show you some roof lines, but they they're not going to change any matter of the setback. The, the 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 room has to go where it has to go because of the where the room is you know for the uh, access and for the topography. You drive by the house, you can see the topography. There's a retaining wall. If you have look at your picture, the retaining wall on the side driveway. It goes from one block to five blocks down down the back. So you can see the topography goes clearly down. Um, so the back doesn't work. It doesn't work for uh, accessibility. It doesn't work for her in, in the house. It would cost them a tremendous amount of money to rip down something that's already built to rebuild it. So it cost them money to do that. It cost them money to get a topography built, and it cost them money to have the, the plans uh, redesigned. Um, so as far as us coming back in, in August, I don't see um, uh, anything changing your mind on that. 
but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, under, I understand your, you know, your consternation with the, with the board's request, but you know, the, the board is in a position where, you know, if you asked us to vote today, we could vote today. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the board's concerns are clear that, you know, what you're asking while it is perfectly reasonable, you know, for what you are, you know, by your reasoning, we're bound by state law and state law does not grant us the ability to say, you know, in all cases, this is what the law says, but this sounds okay. So we're going to break state law and do something yeah. against what state law needs to do. Yeah, I'm not so, asking anybody to do that. We're in a very difficult position as well. And so that's why we're trying to. So, so what is um, criteria one that's holding you guys back that, that you can't even get past criteria one? So essentially criteria one is what are the circumstances relating to the soil conditions, to the shape of the lot or to the topography especially affecting this land or structures, but not generally affecting the, the zoning district in general. Okay, but it's- So it's, you have a lot that you can build and you are, built, you are requesting to build for extremely specific and ex extremely understandable reasons right. to build in the one place where it puts it into, into conflict with what zoning is request is what zoning it states for that zoning district and so you know the what there's nothing about this lot that is so different from every other from other properties in the r1 district that make it so that there's a that there's a reason that that we need to create a non a special non-conformity for this property um, that would not be normally allowed. And I understand the reasons your requests, you're making this request, and I understand the reasons why you're wanting to do it in this location, but though, it, and that's why we wanna to talk to council, but from what our understanding is of state law, that we do not have the discretion to provide the relief that you would like to have. And, Criteria one, though, is not applicable for this, uh, you know, uh, application. It, it, it doesn't hold ground. Criteria one doesn't hold ground on, on what we need. We, we can build, we can build another, uh, another, by law, we can build another house. Why, this is exactly why we cannot find that there is something about this lot that is particular to this lot that requires the granting of a variance. Well, the, the granting of the variance is it has to go in that location for accessibility. The, the girl will not be able to go in her house you if can it add doesn't to the go there. Building. You could add to the front, you could add on the driveway side. There are other locations on this land. So then I take the driveway and move the driveway on this side? Uh, what, you know, I, I don't wanna, you know, belabor this too much. We right. do have another couple who has asked, you know, who okay. granted you All right. first. All right. so, um, I, I am trying to be. What, what I will do then um, is I would ask for the extension for August 30th. Um, since you guys are not uh, comfortable with this and we're not comfortable with this, I guess we'll, we'll, you guys will send us what you're looking for. We'll get you some more information. You'll see council, we'll see council. And, um, you know, uh, until then, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Okay. So with that, um, I would request a motion to continue the variance application the variance hearing for 12 Prospect Avenue until Tuesday, August 30th at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mills. Aye. Mr. Deli. Aye. Mr. Hoffman. Aye. Holly. Aye. Both I, we are continued on 12 Prospect Avenue until Tuesday, August 30th. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the couple that let us uh, uh, get in between them. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Rick Valerelli, Board Administrator. Yes, Rick. Can we just be clear on what we are asking the applicant to resubmit? So the recommendation from the board is that they consider an alternative that would avoid the need for the side yard variance. Okay. In other words, something that would be could be granted by right. Correct. Something that could be granted by right. Okay. If just, they're able to come up with that, then at the continued hearing, the board would basically be um, voting to to withdraw, um, and then they could proceed, you could proceed directly with the with the inspectional services. Um, if it's a different application that requires some other relief, then the board would need to discuss it at that time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And should and as we said before, also the board will discuss with town council whether there is any other mitigating legislation, and if there is, so we will notify the applicant as, um, as quickly as we're able. Yes, got that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next on the is docket 3706, 1315 Adams Street. Um, appreciate the patience of the, the applicant and they're allowing the uh, prior applicant to proceed in front of them. If I could ask them to go ahead and introduce themselves, um, I will go ahead and load up the documents for this year. Thank you. My name's Ann Dwyer Wilmer. Uh, can you hear me? We're at 15 Adams Street. Um, Jeremy Wilmer with me. And we also have Frank Dill, who's the architect, who's helping, well, doing preparing the plans and application, and Rachel White, the builder, um, here with us. Uh, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I'd like to present. Um, Absolutely. Do you have a presentation? Uh, yes, I, I do. It's pretty much the same, but it's in a different order. So I could pull that up. Uh, Mr. Bellarelli, does Mr. Dill need specific permission to do that? Uh, uh, let's see if I can do this. How's that? Perfect. Does that work? Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, my name is Frank Dill. I'm an architect representing uh, Jeremy and Ann, uh, the property owners, uh, since 2014. Ann and Jeremy live with their two children in the upper dwelling unit of the two family uh, and intend to reside there for the foreseeable future. Ann and Jeremy are requesting a special permit to add a shed dormer uh, to their existing non-conforming uh, two-family dwelling uh, solely to provide additional living space for their family. Um, these photos show the existing two-family residence, which was constructed, uh, let's see, I'm having a little trouble advancing, I'm sorry. Um, there we go. Um, uh, it was constructed around 1921, prior to the adoption of the current zoning bylaw, and the proposed shed dormer would be uh, roughly in this area on the northeast side of the roof only, so a single dormer. Um, the existing property and residents are non-conforming with respect to lot size, lot coverage, street frontage, front and left side yard, height and usable open space requirements. Uh, specifically, the usable open space is actually considered to be 0% uh, because it fails to meet the 25 foot uh, dimension in both directions. Um, we are not proposing to increase the footprint or the existing non-conformities of the structure. Uh, the two family is one of the dominant styles in East Arlington, as, as, as I'm sure you know, and third floor additions are also quite common in this neighborhood. Uh, this is just the existing third floor plan. Um, so it's finished space right now. There are two bedrooms, one in the front, one in the back. There is a half bathroom right now uh, under the roof. Um, it's a little bit of an awkward arrangement because you have to pass through the front bedroom to get to the bedroom in the back. Um, the proposed plan is here. Uh, the shed dormer is along this side. Um, so the proposed plan would have one full bathroom, again, a bedroom in the front, a bedroom in the back, and then a small study. And then there's some additional headroom that's gained uh, through the dormer to make a stackable laundry and sort of a, a, an actual full-size, full-height closet. 
Um, all right, so the uh, Arlington Residential Design Guidelines uh, do call for sustainable practices and to reduce the operational energy uh, consumption and carbon emissions for the project. We're proposing several things, uh, triple glazed windows, insulation and air sealing improvements, electrification and reduction of fossil fuel use and reinforcement of the roof for uh, uh, future PV panels. Um, so this is the existing east side of the house. Uh, this is uh, as it exists right now. Um, so it's got a hip roof with uh, two gabled, uh, two hip dormers on the front and back. And we are proposing a shed dormer right there. Um, so we're designing this, we're looking at the uh, residential design guidelines in the design of the dormer, uh, specifically the length, uh, the dormer, the proposed dormer is 20 feet long, um, which is less than half the width of the main roof, which is about 50 feet uh, gutter to gutter. Um, we're maintaining that, uh, that existing hip roof ridge. We're not proposing to change that. And we're maintaining the very broad eave line that goes all the way across. It's about a 20 inch deep eave, so pretty substantial. Um, we are trying to respond to the second floor windows with the windows on the third floor. We're sort of centering this pair over the pairs on the floors below. Um, this is the street elevation as built. And then this is the proposed uh, elevation for the front. We're also trying to keep the pitch uh, relatively steep. It's a three and a half in 12, uh, which also helps to reduce the volume of the dormer, especially from the street side. Um, and that's, uh, I'd like to keep this brief. Um, we welcome your questions and comments and uh, thank you for your consideration. And shall I stop sharing now? Sure. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, application. Um, as was stated, this is brought before the board primarily because um, this property, as many, 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 many properties in Arlington, has zero usable open space. And the creation of additional gross floor area within the house requires the addition of additional usable open space, of which there is none, which is an extension of a, an existing nonconformity. And as such, uh, the board needs to make a determination um, under Section 813B and also under uh, Section 6 of Chapter 40A that um, such such change, such intensification of the existing nonconformity will not uh, be significantly more detrimental to um, to the neighborhood. And uh, that the board typically makes that determination using the criteria for a special permit. Uh, what is, is a special permit application in this case? Um, so just reviewing the documentation, you know, it's, it's an existing nonconforming lot. But as stated, has use, zero usable open space. There is no new dimensional nonconformity. The only nonconformity that is changing is the requirement for usable open space, uh, which is more of a, a clerical change than anything else. So here you can see the attic floor is extended from 395 square feet to 548 square feet. plan that was shown by the, the applicant's architect. Oh. Quick review of the drawing. So they're putting the shed dormer on the east side. So for the sit things and then section through and then proposed side elevation. elevation. Are there questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Uh, at, at the outset, I'd like to thank Mr. Dill for what I thought was a particularly good presentation. Um, I wanted to focus in on the sustainability things and particularly electrification, but if you could just take up a, a minute or so uh, explaining a little bit more what it is that 
uh, you're planning to do, I think it would be helpful. No. Sure. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of our projects involve converting, uh, you know, fossil fuel, natural gas uh, systems to electric. Uh, in this case, um, Ann and Jeremy, you already have air source heat pumps in your home. Uh, we are sort of expanding that system by adding a new one. Uh, so all electric heating and cooling for the study space. Um, part of the project right now, I believe, is replacing the first floor water heater and switching from natural gas to electric resistance heat. Um, you're also removing uh, your uh, radiators, uh, which I, I believe you use as a backup system now, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, oh, uh, Oops. yes, correct. Okay, great. Um, so I, I, they've already made some moves for elect electrification and eliminating natural gas. Uh, you guys won't be 100% gas free as a result of this, but it's uh, for this stage, it's mainly the uh, relying on your air source heat pumps for electrically heating for your unit year round and extending that system and replacing the first floor water heater and switching from gas to electric for that. That's a separate dwelling unit though. Right. And Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Chairman. Anything else? While we're commenting on the uh, electrification, have they considered a heat pump water heater? Much more efficient than resistance. It, it is a conversation we were having. We're actually planning to talk with uh, Frank and Rachel about that tomorrow morning. <laughs> Plus, it's a full-time dehumidifier. <laughs> um, they get a great rebate on them these days. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Any further questions? Um, yeah, I'm just gonna quickly. I wanted to just go past the. Um, this is a memorandum from the planning department. Um, they quickly run through the criteria for special permit. Um, this is allowable under special permit. Uh, we're not changing any aspect of public convenience or welfare or traffic congestion. There won't be any burden on the municipal systems. There are no additional special regulations. Um, and Integrity character with the district, uh, as was noted by the by the applicant, they have reviewed the residential design guidelines and made adjustments um, to their plans. Compliance with that, uh, especially in the the size of the dormer, the location of the dormer, uh, the alignment of the the dormer relative to the eave and the windows below, and also in regards to. Um, the energy conservation and energy-minded aspects of the residential design guidelines, uh, and this would not create any excessive use in the neighborhood. Oops. So this is um, the current house. You can just make out the hip of the roof, and so the proposal is to add a single shed to this side. Um, as you can see, this and then another gabled roof building that has basically a shed on both sides, creating a gable. And um, on this side, there are other additional um, similar roofs uh, in the neighborhood, including roofs with photovoltaic in several locations. And where the photos were shown before, this is existing the side of the house that would have the proposed dormer, uh, and that is the front of the house. The uh, planning department feels that the proposal would be uh, consistent with the special permit criteria. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, is this part of the half story um, or is this a full story now? Um, it, so, um, let me switch. I guess, uh, I don't know if I was supposed to answer that, but I, according to my calculation, calculations, it is still a half story. Okay. Um, and I have some documentation of that in the drawing set. And, uh... Yeah, so it would be going up to 548 square feet um, under seven, of seven feet or higher. 
and the floor below is 1455. So it'd be well below half. Any further questions for the board? That I will go ahead and open um, this hearing for public comment. Again, public comment is taken as it relates to the matter before us and to assist the board in this determination. Um, if you would like to speak and you are on Zoom, you may raise your hand using the raise hand feature at the participants tab. If you are calling in, you may dial star nine. Uh, with that, uh, we have uh, one request to speak from Mr. Moore. Oh, Mr. Moore, you're on mute. Thank Here you. Sorry, usually I'm better that way. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. She, uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont State. Um, I, I, I want to applaud definitely the folks' uh, approach to um, using the how the guidelines for design. I, I, I want to encourage that wherever I hear about it. And the more and more that gets used, I think the better and better things are. So I appreciate uh, the fact that those uh, the folks went ahead and did that. Um, let me ask you a question though. Is this a condominium or is this a two family home that's owned by one of the people living here? We own the the full structure. It's currently my parents res residing. Ah, ah okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, thank you, yeah, that obviates my question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. All right, is there any other members of the public who wish to address the board? Once, going twice. I'll go ahead and close public comment for this hearing. Um, so to reiterate the question before the board, um, this is a request for essentially a section six determination or a determination that uh, the proposed intensification of the existing non-conformity in regards to usable open space is not significantly more detrimental. Um, the applicants have uh, presented, uh, presented well as application um, showing a single shed dormer being added up to the uh, the attic roof of a with a hipped roof um, that appears to be in keeping with the recommendations of the residential design guidelines. Um, are there any further questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion in regards to this application. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the application be uh, approved. Um, subject to the standard conditions, which I think that we haven't had a chance to go to yet tonight. You are correct. One second, I will find the... Ah, here we go. Um, so the three standard conditions that the board would attach to a special permit. Uh, the first one is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two is that the building inspector is hereby notified that he's to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time there's a determination that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1 and that the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware, I don't have in my own mind any other conditions. And if nobody else does, then I can continue the motion <laughs> to Please. its conclusion. Uh, so I move that we, uh, again, that we approve this application subject to the standard conditions that the chair just read into the record. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So the Vote before the board is a vote to approve the special permit for 1315 Adam Street with the three standard conditions. Uh, it was a motion by Mr. Hanlon, seconded by Mr. DuPont. Is there any question as to what the vote entails? 
seeing none, roll call vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Chair votes aye. The special permit for 1315 Adams Street is approved with three standard conditions. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You know, I think we mel mellow a little bit as the evening goes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was just an easy one, Pat. <laughs> and what, uh, can, can I just ask a, a clarification? So uh, you guys will write the decision yes. and that'll be voted on the next meeting. Do we, do we need to wait for that before we proceed with any other, uh, with our regular permit application? Mr. Valarelli? I think Mr. Valarelli stepped out. Oh, Mr. Valarelli stepped out. Um, if you wouldn't mind getting in touch with Mr. Valarelli in the morning, he can straighten that out. Okay. And I spoke to him today a little bit, so we can talk. Oh, perfect. Great. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Um, so for the board, uh, so the next meeting of the board will be Tuesday, August 30th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we have now four new cases and two continuances. So I apologize that the 30th will be a bit of a night. Um, there are new cases for 33 Barnum Street, 49 Valentine Road, and 60 Highland Avenue, and 101 Robbins Road. And then we will also have a continuance for 24 Grandview Road and the continuance for 12 Prospect Avenue. That will all be on Tuesday, August 30th, um, as well as vote uh, on the final uh, the final opinion for uh, 1315 Adams Street voted on that at that hearing as well, and possibly uh, minutes. Are there any questions from the board? Seeing none, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting, and especially like to thank Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, Kelly Lynam, and Marissa Lau for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the reporting made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman could I ask a question before you adjourn? Mr. Moore? Uh, I'm wondering if there's been any news at all on the 40B application for 10, was it uh, 1025 Mass Ave? 51, 1025 Mass Ave. Um, I have not heard a thing. Okay, thank you, sir. Sure. Um, do I have a second to Mr. Hanlon's motion to adjourn? Second. second. Uh, and a roll call vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Aye. Rigardelli? Aye. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Here votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all so very much. Enjoy the weather. <laughs> 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 right?